that uh, there are people who are spotlighting, trying to spotlight me or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So please take the control. Yeah, sure. So uh, I have one doubt regarding physics experiment yeah. that we have performed earlier. Mm -hmm. So my answer is coming uh, with an error of nearly 2%, 2.5%, like uh, it is something uh, 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 I have already told you that uh, sir also that 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 day was uh, doing our experiment. So he told that we need to uh, minimize our error till only 1% only. So having an error of 2.5% will be wrong. Uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> two percent is not a bad error. I mean, I, I guess it's okay. Uh, but I think you can talk with uh, Partho, Partho Sarathi. Uh, he might be able to help you because he's the one who is going to be evaluating the uh, the lab reports. Okay, it's the students, uh, PhD students who take care of that. So even if I say something, um, probably they're going to evaluate you the way they like. So, and I don't want to micromanage. So actually, due to the limitation in bound sensitivity, I'm not able to do it more accurately. Like I, I have already done it more than two times, but it's yielding the same result. Like within the change of two or three visits, it is coming the same value. Then just, just let him know. Just let Partha Sarathi know. And uh, I think the other student is Anupam. I'm not sure his what his name is. Partha Sarathi is my student, so I can talk to him on, on your behalf. It's okay. Uh, you can also tell him directly your problem. Okay. I think it's it's so, patchable. It's so patchable. So he, he, only, he only told us to minimize our error within one percent range. Like I yeah, already he, talked yeah. to him earlier on group, okay. and he told us that uh, your error is two point five percent, and you need to. Uh, Minimize it, it made up to only one person only because okay. my, it's, my it's, suggestion it's is that you can yeah you can ask uh, some of your group members to take the data and uh, see how their errors are doing and then uh, you can use their data if you want within your group so two of us have done the experiment and nearly both of us are getting same value okay okay then i i will talk to him then okay okay so thank you okay, okay. Okay, so let's uh, jump uh, right into the uh, uh, into the topic. Uh, we were dealing with damped silver harmonic oscillators. Remember, damped SHMs. Okay, um, I, I told you guys there are many places uh, in in technology where uh, you have uh, simple harmonic oscillations and where damping is required or not required. Okay. Let's say, um, uh, how um, do you guys know how time is kept on um, on satellites? What measures time in satellites? Or do you guys know how GPS works? How do GPS work? Uh, you know, geographical positioning. So system. GPS works with actually three satellites. They give sim simultaneous uh, location of ours and uh, according to with uh, simulating it, we get our location. Three satellites from the Earth. Uh, yes. Does it give you location really? What does it give you? I mean, if it, if it gives you, if, the, if it gives the location for everybody asking for it, it'll be swamped, don't you think? Like there are millions of people trying to access GPS technology from uh, Earth, and the satellite has to give the location for every single one of them. Don't you think it is a huge uh, uh, issue for the servers on the, on the satellites to give the position for everyone? So we get the location directly from the satellite or the broadcasting center. Actually, I don't know about it. Okay. So I know how our positioning is done. It's done from three to four, three circles simultaneously, and the exact point of our exact location yeah, is all determined. Yeah. yeah. So this is our Earth, whatever, and you have satellites. What happens is these satellites don't do anything at all. They what they do is they just send out pulses periodically. Uh, 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 with uh, with certain period, they send out pulses. And that's it. That's all they do. They just send out pulses. Okay, and their locations are very, uh, uh, very specific. We know where these uh, these uh, uh, these satellites are exactly with respect to our position. Okay, just by 
just by um, calculating the phase shift between uh, the uh, the uh, these pulses. Okay, if you're here, you will be reaching. You will be receiving the the pulses with a certain phase shift. If you're here, you'll be receiving the phase shift from this with a certain with a with a certain phase shift. Do you understand what I'm saying? Each satellite will have a different phase shift depending upon your location. So are you sharing your screen? Oh, am I not? Sorry. No, sir. No, sir. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm too excited to teach that I forget things. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So this is your Earth. Okay. Uh, and uh, these are different locations, right? And you have these satellites. These are the satellites in the, in the sky, geostationary. You know, these are geostationary satellites. They have to be stationary with respect to Earth, okay? Which means they are very far away, okay? I think about 36,000 kilometers. I'm not sure exactly how long, how far, okay? They are stationary with respect to Earth and we know exactly where they are. At least the GPS machines know exactly where they are. Okay, so for each location, the pulses that are sent by each of these satellites are going to differ by a phase. Am I right? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so at each location, yes, if you if you know which satellite is sending the pulses, and if you know the phase difference between uh, this pulse, pulse from satellite one and pulse from satellite two and pulse from satellite three, you can easily figure out where you are with respect to all the three satellites. Am I right? Yes, sir. Right, that's sir. it. That's it. That's, that's, that's GPS. That's it. OK, so the GPS do not give you anything more than just a stream of pulses with a very specific frequency. OK, and these pulses have to be generated by a clock, right? You have to have a very specific clock in each one of these satellites that sends out these pulses. And what are those clocks? Uh, they're defined by uh, time interval between the uh, jump, jumping in cesium atom. Very good. Exactly. Those are atomic clocks. Exactly. Yes. Those are atomic clocks. They are extremely precise. Okay. And the electrons, basically, the cesium atom is here, and the electrons goes from here to the higher energy state, and then jumps back, and then goes up and jumps back, and so on. It does that so many times within a second. Okay, and you, you use that information to define time. Okay, so basically what the electron is doing is it's doing simple harmonic motion. Why is this guy, I think he is using a different, um, different email or something. Anyway, all right, so the, basically the electron is doing a simple harmonic motion between these two electron, two uh, energy levels. That's all it's doing. And you're using that simple harmonic motion to define your time. You understand that? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so if there is a damping, let's say, if there is a little bit of damping in this scenario, okay, let's say the, the electron is radiating a small amount of energy, if there is a small um, uh, uh, spread in this energy level, let's say some delta E. Yeah. Sir, how the atomic clock work? The okay, the exact technology I don't understand. I don't know. Maybe I can read it up and or I can add a video to the exact technology. But the point is, it it works because you when you when an electron jumps from uh, uh, oscillates between two energy levels, it does it in a very precise time. Okay, the 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 time difference between the oscillations from one energy level to another uh, to uh, to uh, I mean, to one to two, let's say, one energy level to another level energy level, this, ener this time is very precisely defined, extremely precisely defined because of the uncertain relations of delta E, delta T is greater than or equal to H cross or over two or something like that. So if delta T is very precisely defined, uh, 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 de de okay, delta E, basically the energy difference between this is extremely precisely defined. So delta T, delta T is also precisely defined to a, within a certain limit within a certain, um, uh, certain uncertainty, okay? Within a certain uncertainty, H cross, delta T is also defined, well-defined, okay? So the oscillation of the electrons between these two energy levels, the time takes for time it takes for the oscillations is also defined very, very precisely, okay? I can dig deeper, but this is the idea. 
Okay, sir. Okay, I, I, I think uh, how exactly it is uh, converted into uh, uh, into a signal and uh, you know made it to a clock, I don't know. The engineering part, I don't know. Okay, I can look it up for you. Okay. Okay, sir. But but what I what I know is that the electrons go through a simple harmonic motion within the cesium atom. I mean, approximately. Okay, in a certain sense. All right, and this uh, this harmonic motion obviously there are there is going to be some. It's not friction, but there is going to be an energy loss. Okay, the the electron when it when it accelerates, it does lose energy. Uh, in, between uh, between set orbitals, it doesn't lose energy, but maybe there are some perturbations, meaning that there are uh, there are other cesium atoms that perturb the energy levels and all that. So there is a chance of losing energy of these electrons for these electrons. Okay, when you have energy loss, we call that as friction, right? Right. So in this case, if you want the cesium atom to be very precise, extremely precise, what do you want to do is you you want to first keep them really really cold. And you want to have as small interactions as uh, as possible between different cesium atoms. You you find out all the ways that are possible to minimize the error in the simple harmonic motion oscillation motion oscillations. Okay, so what you're doing effectively is reducing r, the r uh, the the r that we used in the simple harmonic equation, the coefficient for friction. That r has to be really really small. For the cesium atoms, for the cesium electrons, yeah. electrons, yeah. Sir, why is only cesium atoms are required for atomic clock? Uh, because they're. It depends on the energy level. Uh, uh, how how well defined these energy levels are. Okay, if the energy levels are very crisp, if the delta E is really small, then the energy levels are really crisp, right? So. Uh, and also about the interactions between uh, neighboring atoms and all that. Okay. The, basically, in cesium atoms, the energy levels are really, really crisp. Okay, compared to other atoms, perhaps. Maybe other atoms are possible. I don't know exactly what other atoms are um, are used. Cesium is regularly used. They, uh, you know, I'm sure that the energy levels are crisply defined in cesium. There might be other atoms that I don't know about. Focus. Okay. Okay. Uh, you want the energy levels to be very crisp. You want the energy levels to be very precisely defined, and that's what, only then. Then uh, uh, you know you can really uh, measure the, the transition between the two states of the for the electrons precisely. If the if the energy levels are not precisely defined, if the if the energy level is kind of fuzzy a little bit, then you cannot really define the time of transition clearly, right? You have to have very crisp energy levels. Okay. Cesium atom offers that. Okay, I can dig deeper um, uh, related to your questions about uh, how an atomic clock works. Okay, maybe there's, I'm sure there are a lot of videos about that. You can dig a little deeper, but I, my point is, uh, uh, is that the atomic clocks are, are working on the same principle as any other simple harmonic motion. Okay, it's an oscillating system. And the same as, just like any other oscillating system, it loses energy. Okay, what you want to do is you want to minimize the energy loss in, in a system like that. Okay, so uh, if you if you go to uh, the, the on the other side, uh, on the other hand, if you go to a, a, a dampener for the earthquake, like a huge building that I talked about, uh, uh, these earthquake dampeners, these rollers, you know, they have to have extremely high R. Right, their frictional coefficient must be large. Same as uh, your um, uh, suspenders in your uh, in your bikes, okay? Those suspenders must have huge amount of R, okay? They, you would want them to lose the energy as fast as possible, right? You want the suspenders to absorb the energy, the shocks uh, due to your uh, bumping in the wheels. Am I right? Yeah, so these springs, the, 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 uh, uh, the K of the springs, the R of the springs, the M of the springs, these are all defined very specifically to reduce the amount of vibrations. Okay. 
Does that make sense? Yes. Sir. Okay. Okay. So uh, your your um, your requirements are different depending upon the system you're looking at. Some systems require high R, high dissipation of energy. Some systems require low dissipation of energy. Some systems require you know fast uh, recovery to the equilibrium position. Okay, some systems require the, the system to keep oscillating forever. So depending upon your requirement, you choose your parameters, K, R, and M. Okay. Okay. Same as, uh, you know, an LCR circuit, it's uh, uh, L, C, and R, right? K corresponds to one over C, M corresponds to L, and R corresponds to R, capital R, resistance. Okay, if you're using a radio, and if you want to tune precisely, okay, what you want is you want a sharp uh, resonance. So if you want a sharp resonance, you have to change something in your circuit, which is usually direction of R. Okay. Okay, so by manipulating these parameters, you can basically design a simple harmonic oscillator that serves the purpose that you want it to, okay? You want an earthquake dampener, you want a shock absorber, you want an atomic clock, you want a uh, seismogram, you know, whatever you want. You have to choose the variables, sorry, you have to choose the parameters properly to make it work. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so we, 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 we saw yesterday that there are three different regimes Okay, there are three different regimes where um, where you have R squared over four M square minus S over M is greater than zero, is equal to zero, is less than zero, right? Th these are the three regimes that we saw, one, two, and three, am I right? So this regime is purely uh, exponential decrease. Decrease, right? When this R squared over 4M squared minus S over M is large, which means that your R is large compared to the K, then you know, the system goes back to equilibrium without oscillating. That's what we saw, it's a purely exponential decrease. Okay. In the second case, this is called critical damping. And it goes as E power minus R T over 2M. Okay, the square root is gone, it's zero, right? And the special property of critical damping is uh, uh, reaches equilibrium in the shortest possible time, right? You can use this, you can use this, um, uh, this uh, information to design um, systems, harmonic oscillating systems, that does this for you. If you want a specific, if you have a specific requirement where the time to equilibrium should be short, as short as possible, like in a seismogram, you would want to use this idea, right? It's basically you're, you're trying to design a simple harmonic oscillator for a specific purpose, right? And uh, uh, the third condition is the most important condition uh, with physics, uh, which is basically, this is damped oscillations. All right, these are damped oscillations, which means you will get something like this, this behavior, right? So this is what we did yesterday. We captured all these three scenarios with, with a single equation, differential equation, right? Yes, yes sir. Okay. Okay. So we were uh, basically. I will be concentrating on the on the, on the third um, third uh, uh, regime uh, closely. Okay. Uh, so our equation we derived yesterday x of t equals from c one e power minus r t over two m exponential i omega prime t plus c two e power minus r t over two m e power minus i omega prime t, where omega prime is s over m minus 
r squared over 4m squared. Okay, this is what we derived yesterday. Okay, there are two constants, c1, c2. Okay, because it's a second order differential equation. And you have an oscillatory part, e power i omega t, from e power minus i omega t, and an exponentially decreasing part. Okay, e power minus rt over 2m. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, we will go a step farther, further and uh, try to quantify how damped, how much damped this oscillator is. Like, is it, is it gonna oscillate uh, fast and like die down like that? Or is it gonna keep oscillating, oscillating, oscillating and die down much later? Like, how do you define, how do you quantify this? What is the quantify, what is the quantity that describes how fast it uh, de uh, decays, the amplitude decays or the energy decays? What is the quantity that dictates that? So e to the power minus rt by 2m. Good, yes, exactly. That is what, basically the exponential part is what dictates how fast your amplitude is decreasing, right? Yes, sir. Right? So you, you, your amplitude is decreasing as e power minus rt over 2m, which means how is your energy decreasing? Your energy is proportional to amplitude square, right? Half m omega square is square, remember? So your energy decreases like, e power minus rt over 2m whole squared. Am I right? Yes, yes. All right, okay. So basically your energy decreases is rt over 2m. Oh, sorry, rt over m. So energy, sorry, let me write it down elsewhere. So the energy goes, oops. Your energy goes as e equals e naught e power minus rt over m. Right? Am I right? Yes, sir. Simple as that. Okay. So, uh, this is one of the ways to quantify this. There is another way. Um, basically, now you have an oscillator that, that goes like this. Okay. And you want to quantify how this decrease happens. You don't you don't have access to the uh, uh, to the parameters. This is an experimental setup. Let's say, okay, you are given an experiment that does simple harmonic oscillations. Let's say an oscilloscope, okay. And you're looking at the oscilloscope, and you're you're basically uh, you guys know what an oscilloscope is, right? Yes or no? No sir. No sir. Okay. No sir. Yeah, I'm too old, and uh, you, have, you haven't seen those. Um, these are these are machines where you have a you have a, a very thin wire with a mirror, and uh, you have a light that goes through, and you have a, a screen where the light gets reflected. Okay, this is this thin wire is uh, taut and uh, pegged to two um, support systems. So basically, the wire uh, uh, torsion. There is a torsion in the wire. So when you uh, when you change. Uh, when, when you when you try to displace this mirror, it oscillates back and forth like that. Okay, the light goes back and forth. So that's how we measure um, uh, deflections. Okay, if you if you apply some uh, some electric field which is coupled to the torsion of the of the wire, then that you can measure the amount of electric field using the deflection in the light. Okay. So can you repeat uh, this setup, please, one more? Uh, okay, so basically it is like a thin wire with, and which has an attached mirror. There is a mirror attached to this wire, okay, and it is pegged. And you can you can couple this. There are many ways to couple this. Basically, you can you can couple the the the, the support itself uh, to a to a magnet, let's say, which. Uh, you know, and this can be metal or this can be a magnet as well to a circular magnet or whatever. You can couple it to some external voltage system, voltage source, which makes the support rotate, okay? Okay, if the support rotates, the mirror changes angle, right? So 
the middle change is angled by very small amounts, it's like maybe half a degree or something like that. So if you, if you want to be able to measure that, what you do is you send a light and you, you have a, a big um, screen where the light reflects. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Get it. Sir, in HC Pharma, they are given. Yes, sir. Get it, sir. In, in where? In sir, HC Pharma, sir. What is that? Sir, so HC Pharma book, sir. Oh, it's Verma. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is a it's a it's a usual uh, you know old time uh, machine that we used to use for measuring uh, voltages and currents and all that. Okay, it's an oscilloscope. Okay. This 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 uh, this light oscillates. Oscilloscope. Okay. This is also a simple harmonic motion, by the way. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm not sure they are using it anymore. We have digital old meters these days. We don't care. This this was it used to be very uh, uh, precise and uh, sensitive. Okay. Uh, anyway, so uh, you you can you can basically track the uh, uh, the oscillation and and plot it like this. Okay, and you can try to measure how much of the resistance there is inside the oscilloscope, something like that. You can plot it. Now, if you want, if you are asked to quantify it, okay, you cannot measure energy. It's not easy, but you have to plot. Okay, the plot of the of the of the movement of the light. Okay, this here it is x instead of x you can use theta theta of t, which is basically the angle there. Okay, now how would you quantify the the degrees? How would you quantify this this exponential factor? You don't know r, you don't know m. Okay, you want to derive that from the plot. You have the data. You want to fit fit it to a to the parameters. How would you go about it? Any ideas? So can you repeat the question? I didn't get it. Okay, so basically somebody did some experiment and gave you this, this curve. Did some experiment on a simple harmonic oscillator. You don't know what that simple harmonic oscillator was. You have no idea what it was. It could be an oscilloscope, it could be uh, a, 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 you know, a seismogram, whatever. Any, any oscillating system, some oscillating system. What you get on your screen is, is the data, is this curve, okay? The question is, what is, uh, what are the parameters? Can you, can, you, can you arrive at the parameters of the, of the simple harmonic oscillation? Parameters are R, M, and K. Can you, can you K or S? Uh, here we are using yes, so let's use S. Okay. Uh, uh, you, it, is, uh, it is following a model of exponential decay. So uh, as it, it is very similar to the radio nuclear de uh, decay in the nuclear reaction. So by okay. that we can find the, by seeing the graph, we can find the half-life of the reaction, like uh, at uh, what time the energy gets okay. a value of half value. So by finding the half-life, we can uh, uh, calculate the value of R and M by some doing that thing. Oh, very good. Very good. Exactly. So, very good. Similar, similar stuff. Yeah, go ahead. So another thing, like like we learned in the superposition of SHM, we can find that we can find the frequency of the envelope curve, uh, the curve that is enveloping the inner frequency, and we can also find the frequency. We can find the both frequency, the enveloping frequency and the the main frequency of this curve, and then we can, uh, accordingly, we can find this. Good. You you can measure the frequency. The envelope doesn't have any frequency. The envelope is basically a, a, an exponential decreasing function. Okay, it doesn't have any frequency, but you can always uh, quantify that. You can fit a curve to this line, right? You can always fit a curve to that line and say, keep your alpha t minus alpha t, and what is alpha? You can measure that alpha, right? And that alpha would be r over m, right? You can fit an exponential curve to this curve, to this peak, peaks of the of the uh, uh, of the oscillation, and when you when you measure alpha, alpha becomes r over m. Am I right? Yes, sir. So just it, yes. it, it is you. Used in uh, half-life reaction of yes, yes, exactly, yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah, that's a similar. The equation is very similar to this equation. Yes, you're right. Okay, the half-life. You can measure the half-life. Okay, so there are various uh, uh, names for these kind of measurements. Okay, one one is called logarithmic decrement. They used to do this. Uh, 
in the in the days when they, have, when they did not have computers. So you have to do you have to use some simpler techniques, not just curve fitting. Nowadays you can just you know fit a curve. Uh, you know you look at the line, you just go to the uh, go to your um, MATLAB or uh, Python or whatever. Just uh, you know just use the uh, inbuilt programs to fit the curve, and you get the exponent right away. But in the olden days, they did not have any of that. So you have to define certain techniques to measure these uh, R and M, you know, R, R over M. So one of them is called logarithmic decrement. Okay, we don't need that anymore, but you know, for the sake of uh, completeness, you need to uh, you need to read that. Right? You need to learn this. So what what is logarithmic decrement? It's basically it's pretty simple. Okay, so it's like that, and you have the uh, you have the amplitude at the first oscillation, and the second oscillation, and the third oscillation, and all that. And you have this envelope curve, right? And at some time t, this is e power minus rt over 2m, right? At another, uh, let's say t1, another time e power minus rt2 over 2m, right? Am I right? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah? So basically, yeah. when you do, let's say you do uh, a1 over a2, what do you get? It's e power minus rt1 over 2m times e power rt2 over 2m. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, so it's e power minus RT over 2M times T2 minus T1 plus here. Am I right? Right, sir. So this is, this is yes. what is this? T2 minus T1, this is T. This is T, the time period. Because you're, you're at the peak, you're measuring it at the peak. Am I right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So this is basically e power. So a1 over a2 is basically e power r tau over 2m, where tau is your period. That's it. Right? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay. So all that you have to do to extract the exponent. Now you have a1 over a2 is e power r tau over 2m. Okay, if you want to extract the exponent, all you have to do is to take the logarithm of both sides, log of, log of, right? So log of a1 over a2 is just rt, sorry, r tau over 2m. Okay? Okay, you yes, can measure yes. this one. Okay, so all that you have to do is to take the amplitudes, two amplitudes, successive amplitudes, and take a log of that. Okay, you can do that for a2 over a3, a3 over a4, take an average of all of that, you, you will get this value, r tau over 2m. This is one way of characterizing those numbers. It's one way of getting these numbers. So you have, you have um, two, two uh, pieces of information buried in here. You have r over m information buried, and you have also tau buried in there. Tau is the time period from which you can measure the frequency also. Right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so basically, but wouldn't the tau keep? I'm sorry. So wouldn't the tau keep changing? Like uh, first it was the t two minus t one, but later we can t three minus t two. Uh, and t three minus t two will not necessarily be equal to t two minus t one. No, this is an oscillation, right? See, the omega prime is a constant. Omega prime is what? S over m minus r squared over four m squared. That's your frequency. This is your oscillation frequency, right? E power i omega prime t. This frequency is very specific. It's given. S over m minus r over 4m squared, okay? When the frequency is constant, the time period is also constant. It's just 2 pi over t, right? Omega prime is 2 pi over t, right? So if omega prime is constant, s is a constant, m is a constant, r is a constant. So omega prime is a constant, which means t is a constant. Right? So the okay. time period will not change. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So let me introduce a very important concept for engineers here um, uh, from the point of view of simple harmonic oscillator. Okay. It's called Q factor. Okay. This you will come across quite often in your engineering uh, uh, studies. Okay. So Q factor is one of those one of those numbers that you will get for many machines. What is the Q factor of a microwave? What is the Q factor of your 
um, of your refrigerator? What is the Q factor of your AC, air conditioner? Okay, so if they tell you the Q factor, you will get an idea about the efficiency of these machines. Okay, if the Q factor is large, very large, then you would, you would know that the, the machine is very efficient. Okay, so it kind of it, it gives you an idea of efficiency of measurement, but we will introduce it in a uh, in a simple fashion, and then we will go on to define what it is. Okay, so basically, um, you have a simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, it's oscillating back and forth, and you have a certain energy for that oscillator, and this is a damped oscillator. Okay, so what happens to energy? The energy decreases, right? You know, e power minus R T over M, right? The energy keeps decreasing. Right? Yes, sir. So yes, sir. How would you quantify that decrease in energy? How would you quantify that? You quantify that by saying you, you want to find the time at which E equals E naught into E power minus one. So basically, you start with uh, the oscillation starts with a certain amount of energy, E naught, and the time it takes for the energy to decrease by a factor of E, basically E naught over E, right? So what is the time at which the energy of the oscillating system is E, which is E naught over E? How much time it takes for the energy to decrease by an amount of E? That's a natural logarithm, you know, E, two point something, right? Okay, so what is that time? How much time does it take? Yeah? M by R. Exactly. By yeah, T is M by R. Beautiful. That's it. That is it. Okay. Yes. Sir. That's T is M by R. Okay. Now, the question is, how many oscillations that the system has gone through within that time? How many oscillations? How many radians of oscillations? How many radians the the, the oscillating system has gone through by the time? The energy is decreased by a factor of e. How would you calculate that? So t by tau. So t by tau. So t by tau is the whole time period of the system. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you have a, a, a better idea? What is, so what is the number of find the e? We will find e where it is and then divided by omega. So we are giving like the, the frequency of oscillation. Uh, so we so we have been given the frequency of oscillation, and now we are yeah. giving the time of oscillation. So we we can just multiply the frequency by time. Then. Very good, very good. That's exactly what I want. So basically, number of radians uh, are number of radians the system has a system has gone through is basically omega times omega prime times t, and uh, where t is your uh, uh, r over m. No, sorry, M over R, right? So number of radians the, the, the simple harmonic oscillator has gone through, number of oscillations it has gone through is just omega prime times M over R, right? Yes, yes. sir. Yeah. So basically, this is Q factor. This is Q factor, that's it. That is your Q factor. So more the number of oscillations happen before the energy decreases by, uh, by amount of E, you're, the better the uh, the oscillator is, the better the oscillator is at keeping its energy, right? Let's say if your Q factor of your of your uh, fridge is let's say a thousand, what that means is it makes a thousand oscillations before the energy decreases by before the stored stored energy decreases by an amount of E. Okay, the higher the Q factor, the more efficient the machine is. Am I right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So for an atomic clock, yes. the Q factor can be uh, of the order of 10 to the power six. Okay, that's a huge amount of Q factor. Okay, those many, I know actually it's not 10 to the power six, it's much larger than that, I guess. 10 to the power six is a small number. A a anyway, uh, the Q factor of the atomic clock can be really, really large. Okay. Whereas if you want, a, if you want a, a, an earthquake dampener, you don't want the Q factor to be large. You want the Q factor to be small. You want the system to lose as much energy as possible. 
if you want to have a, a good suspenders, a shock absorber in a car, its Q factor cannot be more than one or two. Okay, it should ideally be less than one. Do you understand the idea? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, Q factor measures the amount of energy that is dissipated. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the number of oscillations that the system makes within a time when the energy decreases by a factor of E. That is the definition. Okay? You will remember that definition. Okay? And it, it kind of measures the uh, efficiency. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, this Q factor, you're going to see this Q factor in many, many uh, uh, forms, many, many avatars. Okay, one is this definition, number of radians that the system goes through before the energy decreases by a factor of E. That is one definition. There is another definition, which is energy stored in the system divided by energy lost per cycle. Okay, this is also related to Q factor. So basically Q over two pi is that. So I have, I have given you one definition, which is basically the number of radians that the system goes through before the energy decreases by a factor of E. That is one definition. The other definition is that energy stored in the system divided by the energy loss per cycle. That is another definition. How does that work? Okay, let's see, let's see how it works. So you have you start with this equation e equals e naught e power minus r t over two m, right? So what is the energy lost per cycle? Hmm? Oh, sorry, not two m. It's m. So what is the energy lost per cycle? Energy lost per cycle is E naught E power minus R over M omega naught or omega prime over two pi, right? So this is the amount of energy, uh, energy, uh, uh, the energy after uh, one cycle. So energy lost is E minus E naught, which is uh, E naught E power minus R over M omega, omega prime over two pi minus E naught, right? This is the amount of energy lost. Am I right or wrong? So one cycle means one oscillation. Yeah, one oscillation, yes. Oh, okay, so, okay. So. Yeah, sorry, one oscillation, yes. <sighs> Boy, I guess so. This is not omega over okay, so it's it's two pi omega. Yeah, it two pi omega, right. Two pi over omega. Okay, so this is the amount of energy lost per, this is energy lost per cycle, right? Am I right? So basically this is E naught into E power minus two pi R over omega prime M minus one, right? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is energy loss yes, per cycle. Sir. And now what is the energy stored in the system? Energy stored in the system is just E naught, right? Energy stored in the system is, stored is E naught, okay? Energy loss is E naught e power minus R, uh, what was that? Two pi R by omega. Two pi, two pi R two by pi M, right? Okay, thanks for reminding. Two pi R by M omega prime minus one. Okay, so you 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 just going to take a uh, uh, take a ratio of these two, right? So this you can uh, simplify. Okay, if the uh, if the exponent is really small, okay, you can expand this as a Taylor expansion, right? E per minus two pi two two pi r over omega 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 prime. You can expand that with the Taylor expansion, right? One minus two pi r over m omega prime plus 
2 pi r over m omega prime squared minus some other one over two factorial, okay? So uh, all of those terms, high order terms, minus one, right? This whole factor is just that the one goes off, you keep the first order term, you neglect the higher order terms. Okay, so the energy lost is approximately equal to E naught times, there is a negative sign, two pi r over m omega prime. Am I right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, so sir. The negative sign basically uh, implies that the energy is lost. You're losing the energy. Okay, it's not gaining, it's losing. And the energy stored is E naught. So basically, uh, Q factor equals the stored energy divided by energy lost in cycle in a cycle is what is that? Two pi r prime. Um, sorry, uh, it's, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. Basically, I'm. I'm Sir, omega m by two pi r. Omega prime divided by two pi r. Okay, so. Am I right or wrong? Yes, sir. Correct, sir. Okay. Okay. M omega prime divided by two pi r. Right. So basically, uh, uh, sorry, I wouldn't define this as a Q factor. The Q factor is already defined, which is M omega prime over R. This is the Q factor divided by two pi, which is Q by two pi. Okay, so this energy stored in the system divided by energy lost per cycle, per cycle is Q by two pi. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, so sir. you will see the Q factor is going to come up again in a couple of couple of different places. Q factor is also related to resonance and bandwidth. Okay. Q factor is also related to bandwidth. I will, I will explain what a bandwidth is later um, when we go to the uh, four stars later part. We will see resonance and we will see bandwidth and all that. Okay. There, Q factor will appear again in a different guise. So apparently this, uh, this, this particular measurement, this particular quantity that we try to measure has many different definitions, okay? It's, it's all related to how energy is dissipated in the system, okay? If the energy is not dissipated too fast, then Q factor is high. If the, if the energy is dissipated too much, then the Q factor is low, that's it. So since we are, you're dealing with machines, machines do repeated things. They all, all the machines do repeated things. They do the same thing over and over and over again. So they are going through cycles, right? So the question is how much energy is being lost per cycle? Okay, in every, every machine, every possible machine, okay? So the Q factor is gonna be extremely important in quantifying energy loss in machines. Does it make sense? Yes. Yeah? Sir. Okay, uh, so uh, I will stop here. Uh, if you guys want to visualize these these oscillations uh, and all that, you can. How many of you know how to code? I sir. Okay, you do how to code. Okay, by, what language? By do you coding do? means to Python to sir. To program. Python. Programming. Python. Python. Okay. Yeah. Python. Python. Okay, and who else? And C plus plus also sir. Uh, very good. Okay. 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 So okay. me too. Yeah. Good. 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 I. I. Uh, my suggestion is that all of you should learn coding. All of you. Okay. Not just one, two of you. One or two of you. All of you must learn coding. Coding is a language that, it's like a common language like English, world over. Okay. You will use coding wherever you go in whatever job you will do. You will need coding. Okay. So you better learn coding. We can uh, like uh, I can I can I can show you. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. I, I'm, yes, just, sir. I'm just using MATLAB. You can visualize these oscillations. You can visualize this this uh, uh, this really uh, easily. Let's say uh, you know I'm I'm typing some coefficients, right? Let's say R. I'm defining your resistance as 0.1. Mass, let's say, is 10. 
I am, we are going to visualize these oscillations. We can visualize these oscillations very simply, right? Now K is one, let's say. So now what would be your omega? Omega is square root of square root of R by uh. R Six to I. So it's an imaginary value. It's an imaginary value. It's not a yeah. It's an imaginary value. It's an I. There is an I there. It's imaginary. So what would be your solution? Solution is x is. We already know the solution. X x is exponential minus r star. Let's define time first. Time equals let's say let's do from zero to ten seconds. Okay, zero to ten seconds. In units of 0.1 steps. That's my time. So my x, which is my oscillation amplitude, x is exponential minus r star time added by this two star m, right? Right? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. so let's just use only one omega, okay? Minus omega dot star time. That is my that is my um, my displacement. Okay. Now x is a complex number. You cannot visualize complex numbers. So what do you have to do is you can just say plot time. Okay. You don't see any oscillations because our time is small and it is decreasing really fast. Okay, my e power, my r is quite high apparently. So basically we are doing a, the regime one scenario. Uh, sorry, regime three, but this, the frequency is quite low. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so if you want to increase the frequency, you can increase the frequency. I'm just going to increase the frequency omega equals some 10 times omega. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to reevaluate that. Yeah. Now I'm doing oscillations. Now the frequency is 10 times and it is decreasing, but very slowly. Do you see the. Oh. Yeah, yes. You see yes, the yes, decrease? Difference in, yes, difference in P. Yeah, there is a decrease. Hold on. Let me let me show you that. You see the decrease? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Because I just increased the number of oscillations. Okay. Okay. You can you can play around with this R and M and K and you can visualize uh, how the oscillation decreases. Okay, you can do all sorts of these experiments. Just you know, I, what what I have written like three or four lines of code and that's it. I mean, not it's pretty simple, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So if you pick up coding, you can actually test your hypothesis. You can you can do these experiments computationally. You don't have to really have a system. You don't have to have a system. Okay, you can vary R, M, and K and see what happens. Okay. You can you can uh, you can visualize um, uh, behavior of the system going from regime one to regime two and regime three and all that. Okay, you can do critical damping. You can do um, uh, exponential decay. You can do oscillations with decay. You can do all of that. Okay, you can also look at the imaginary part of X and see what happens there. What does that mean? Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, so you can do all of that experiment if you know a little bit of coding and you can do it really, really fast and uh, uh, easily because these days the, the compilers and interpreters are really, really smart. So you can do a lot of sir. experiments. Yeah. Sir, for just yeah. everyone out there, uh, actually, if they want to do this, they can just download the Anaconda software. It's like complete package and it will take one hour YouTube course, you one hour YouTube video to learn Matplotlib. Actually, sir, Matlab is a little bit old version. We now yeah. use Matplotlib for this. 
Yeah, that's all. And it's just one other course, and we can learn all of it. Yeah, MATLAB is open source, so you everybody can use it freely. MATLAB, MATLAB is uh, is uh, proprietary. Okay, it uh, earns oh, a lot of money, but uh, MATLAB is cheap. I mean, basically, no money. It's it's open source. It's no, which so is Mat good. Mat 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 MATLAB is free. You can use. Yeah, it. exactly. MATLAB is free. MATLAB is open source, uh, closed. I mean, it's uh, proprietary. It amount it costs a lot. So I, I'm not expecting you guys to learn MATLAB. Python and MATLAB uh, are R. Those are good, good software, good uh, languages. Okay. So just one Anaconda, uh, Anaconda software. It's a complete package. It will give everything. Yeah, like Anaconda is mostly, mostly it's, it's, Yeah, it's called an IDE, Integrated Development Environment. Okay. So the yeah, IDE is uh, different with the Jupyter Notebook, but Anaconda is a package of all the science, all all the libraries. Like different libraries are there, no? Though all the libraries right. package. So everything, in everything included. Okay, okay, okay. I I don't know much about Python uh, here. I'm a MATLAB guy more of. Uh, anyway, that's a good suggestion. Good suggestion. Thank you. So people, um, if you want to do coding, uh, you know, you can use Anaconda, you can use Jupyter, you can use R, you know, whatever, whatever you like. Okay. Okay, but I yes. just suggest everybody to take up some form of coding. All right, and do experiments, play with it, learn from it. Okay. Okay. Okay, any questions? Any questions?